The His Girl Friday podcast is brought to you in part by Messenger Fellowship, living the kingdom, fulfilling the call, proclaiming the truth. How's it going, everyone? This is Cameron Fry, His Girl Friday, jumping in on a Monday, rather Tuesday afternoon. It's my lunch break. I got more than enough time to cut what should be a shorter than normal pod. Uh, So over the extended holiday weekend, I was working on part two to my eyes wide open, the Keys to Watchful Prayer series. For those who didn't tune in for part one, basically what I'm doing is I'm combining some verses and commentary concerning specific situations we encounter at work where in the moment, we need to remember who we are in Christ and in the spirit of hiding God's word in our hearts, I desire that through this series at large to equip and default us towards God's word during stretching circumstances to help us, again, hide God's word in our hearts so that we'll abide in his word in our interactions with colleagues, clients. That is the end goal with this series. How do we stay watchful in prayer? And not just any prayer, workplace prayer, prayer that happens on the clock, prayer that happens spontaneous on the go when we face some challenging, arduous forks in the road, those intersections where it's like, we don't really know what the right move is. There's our sense of right and there's God's sense of right. And then we're trying to stay within company protocol a lot of times. We're trying to... uh, follow the conviction of the Holy Spirit, but we don't even know how that translates to staying in bounds, if you will, staying in the lines of corporate expectations. Again, twofold purpose to this series and to this post and pod to equip and default us toward God's word during challenging times, when clients are biting our heads off, when we're struggling to get along with our team and to help hide God's word in our hearts. So we'll abide in his word and interactions. That's the twofold purpose. We'll explore different vocational components as the time goes on. My goal is to have as many parts as needed, maybe six, seven, eight, who knows? But for now, let's start with how we can encourage saints at work, how we can endure with dealing with challenging clients and situations. Broad topics, but you kind of need to start broad and then narrow into specifics as you go rather than the other way around. Um, so... Again, only two points, really, but there's several Bible verses within each point. That's why I want to take my time, not rush, and not go longer than a thousand words, but at the same time, not come at you like a fire hose. Uh, So I will probably directly reference some passages and indirectly reference others, reading some verses whole and then just saying, hey, in your quiet time, check out this. So... Encouraging clients. Okay, so encouragement is a multifaceted word. We don't have time to get into a strong concordance and break down the Hebrew Greek origins, but a lot of us have a generalized sense of how to do this. So this is not a how to, but it's just to stress the importance of staying consistent in not just encouraging clients, hey, you're doing a good job, but also encouraging unity, bringing people together. A lot of times we encourage people in part so that we can feel good about ourselves, to boost morale. I think boosting morale is top of the list for a lot of organizations. Encouragement is the spiritual gift, but we even inadvertently and secondhandedly not abuse it, but we undermine its value and role. Colossians 3.14, we'll start here. Beyond all of these things, put on and wrap yourselves in unselfish love, which is the perfect bond of unity for everything is bound together in agreement when one seeks the best for others. And this ties into Philippians 2, 2 through 3. I've referenced before on the pod. Make my joy complete by being of the same mind, having the same love toward one another, knit together in spirit, intent on one purpose, and living a life that reflects your faith and spreads the gospel, the good news regarding salvation through faith in Christ. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit through factional motives or strife, but with an attitude of humility, being neither arrogant nor self-righteous, regard others as more important than yourselves. 1 Corinthians 3.9, For we are God's fellow workers, his servants working together. 
God's cultivated field, his garden, his vineyard, God's building. Wow. Amplified. <laughs> You're killing it so far. Ephesians 4, 3, make every effort to keep the oneness of the spirit in the bond of peace, each individual working together to make the whole successful. You're kind of getting the gist here, the concept of oneness, but also togetherness. God is wanting to stitch our uniquenesses together where one of the common bonds is seeking the best for others. That's, in short, humility. 1 Thessalonians 4, 18 and 5, 11 uh, I'll just reference them real quick. Therefore, comfort and encourage one another with these words concerning our reunion with believers who have died. Therefore, encourage and comfort one another and build up one another just as you are doing. So these um, passages are often referenced and they're not as specific as the, some of other passages in Paul's letters. This is why I started with Colossians, 1 Corinthians, and Ephesians, and Philippians, really. Um, Hebrews 13, thir- uh, 3.13 ties it all together. But encourage continually one another every day as long as it is called today and there is an opportunity so that none of you will be hardened into settled rebellion by the deceitfulness of sin its cleverness delusive glamour and sophistication again that's the amplified version so all these hit home together and i wanted to just unpack them a little bit again offer some friendly commentary again i'm I'm not trying to tell you how to live your life at work, but I want to encourage you towards some adhesive principles, adhesive in the sense that if we are diligent and faithful and in agreement on these points, then we will see greater unity abound. That sense of maybe not personal belonging, but being able to help people come together sincerely, being able to relate more, being more willing and open to be transparent and vulnerable at times, not being afraid to ask for help. Again, in the context of teamwork, you're on the job, you're on mission, being able, you know, I'm not saying treat everyone the same way, but I do think our approach to selfless service, how we love one another, there's some common denominators that we can't be exclusive in. We can't compartmentalize the principle from person to person, even though, yeah, like when you're on the job, you know, I I have to encounter this sometimes, you know, I wouldn't know these people if it weren't for an accepted position that was offered to me at one point. And I wouldn't have the privilege to know these people had I not been given the skills and the qualifications to not only be offered the job, but to say yes to it. And I'm glad for that because these are some, I work with some amazing, incredible people and the nature of the relationship is professional first and anything that comes after that is just bonus, not auxiliary, but just, it is, um, it's not even secondary, but it's just, you know, what comes first. Uh, but still when you're a believer, you understand that I don't have to undermine the fact that you are a co-ambassador alongside me. You are a co-laborer alongside me. We are in the trenches together. There is a togetherness that, you know, it can't just be about bottom lines and profit margins. We get to make joy complete together. Same mind, same love, knit together. As long as we're on the clock, we are in this together. And that's the important thing. You may not be buddy, buddy, friends, you may not be the type that hang. And I think a lot of times it's where lines are drawn because we are on the clock with our colleagues and then we get off the clock and that's the time to invest with family, with friends who aren't our actual co-workers. And we need to have a balanced assortment in our lives. It's healthy. My thing is we often rank and compare and prioritize. And when you're in the moment, you just need to be in the moment. Like, let's just simplify the whole thing, shall we? I know it's great to feel like you belong to an inner circle. And I'm not saying we should abandon those inner circles. I'm not saying that, you know, to act the same way around your college as you do about your church family. But I'm saying let's not rank. The interactions are going to be different. How we communicate might be a little different. But we need to love one another the same way. 
we need to understand we're still knit together. Just because you have someone, a colleague who might be indifferent towards you doesn't mean that you're not knit together. You're knit together in some capacity, even if it's on a limited basis. There's still that potential to be one purpose, life on life, being able to reflect your faith and spread the gospel together. It may be, again, in small amounts, not every cup size is the same. Not every opportunity is the same. Not every relational interaction has to be um, of similar parameter. But as long as it's today, you have an opportunity to be one in the Spirit and to continually encourage every day. Each day, stitch together. Perfect bond, unity, being a common thread throughout. You are God's fellow workers, His servants working together. I love the I love First Corinthians three nine. Cultivated, filled the garden. You are implanted. He entrusts you. He has planted you for such a time as this, uh, during this specific season of your life. God's building that hits home too. It's like you are a structure. You are an organization. You're an organism that has life that is meant to continue to bring life and spread life. What are you spreading? Will your clients know how much you love by how you love one another? What is the motive for that love? What is the motive for self-service and outreach? You might be doing good things, but out of wrong reasons. Is the attitude of humility what's driving the conversation? What's driving every endeavor and practice? Every manual that's developed, every conversation on the phone, every meeting that happens behind closed doors or in the open in the conference room, whatever. The Bible has much to say about community and relationships. I wanted to add more verses to this, but I couldn't. The word is just that rich on it. Many agree to the principles of these passages, but the more I reflect on them, the more I think that we just, we're not so unconditional. (laughs) These absolutes must reflect unconditionally in our lives, regardless of setting. But we struggle to do that. Why is that? Why are we one way with our church family, one way with our family, our actual family, perhaps, inner circle? Why is it contrast to interactions with colleagues and clients? A lot of different answers to that, but I'll just put this out here for thought. Well, I I believe many of us compartmentalize who we do mission with because we've lost sight of what mission is altogether. Why do we do anything at the end of the day? Is it to hit our bottom lines, to feel fulfilled, meaningful, to belong? Or is it with the heart cry of, as in heaven, so on earth, Matthew 6.10? As in heaven, so in my office. As in heaven, so with my clients entrusted in my care. As in heaven, so with my colleagues. As in heaven, so with my team I get to serve alongside with. I could go on. Let's not be a people who rank, compare, and categorize. Anytime we detach kingdom from our uniqueness and calling, we fall into these traps. Where we tier community. We look at someone and we're like, well, they're not in this category of of relationship, so I'm not going to worry about extending this fruit or I'm not going to worry about encouraging because they probably have that in other places. We don't know that. Are we so afraid of being repetitive or, you know, looking foolish? If you're encouraging someone with humble intent, you know, not a I scratch your back, you scratch mine. If the agenda is pure, you're not a fool for doing that. Now, if you're unauthorized to say something and you say it, Maybe you find yourself in a situation where you got ahead of God in a given moment. The timing was off. I could, I could see that, but I think we're so afraid of what people think, we let that fear rob us of these divine opportunities and being on assignment with Jesus day in and day out. There's going to be a closer examination of this point in part three. But for now, consider the temptation, again, to tear off relationships based on the nature of individual connections over corporate identity because you have an identity and there's also a corporate identity who are in Christ matters. Rely on the spirit as you make God's joy complete from one to all and big or small. Encourage family, friends, and colleague clients alike with the intent to build them up as God builds you up. After all, and I mentioned this before, but I'll say it again. We're all co-laborers and co-ambassadors called to be codependent on God. I know codependent, oof, that sounds bad. You could look at it as interdependent, interdependent if you want. But co-dependent implies it implies that you understand the concept, you know, that God knows the power of one, that you have received the power of one, being that you are uniquely and wonderfully made 
as the psalmist declares, but you're not getting so wrapped up in that where you're not pouring out on other people. Reliance is meant to be a contagious thing. Trust is meant to be a contagious thing. Worship, not meant to be just kept in a vacuum. Work is worship. That's what I mean. I don't want to be just relying on God by myself. I want other people to be reliant on God too. I, I want to help people do that and point people in that direction if at all possible. And that's why one of the reasons why I'm cutting this. As much as we love the go, we can't get anywhere without the co. Next and last point, enduring challenges with confidence. Hebrews 12, 3. Just consider and meditate on him who endured from sinners such bitter hostility against himself. Consider it all in comparison with your uh, with your trials so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Ephesians 5, 6. Let no one deceive you with empty arguments that encourage you to sin, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. 1 Peter 2, 4 through 10. Now, this is the big one. This is key. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, put in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house. There's another structure metaphor to be a royal holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. For it stands in scripture, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but uh, for those who who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of crumb, uh, stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous, marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy." And lastly, Titus 2.15, tell them these things, encourage and rebuke with full authority. Let no one disregard or despise you. Conduct yourself and your teaching as to command respect. Now, that last line, I think we could abuse sometimes, especially when we lose sight of who we are in Christ. But collectively, these scriptures are meant to help us see, again, our corporate identity in the face of individual moments when we're struggling with a situation or clients. There's a lot of different pressures we face at work, a lot of different ways to feel overwhelmed. We, and this is not the time or place to get, you know, ways deep in them. You, you guys know, after all, what is bearing weight in your life. And some of this hits home and is borderline too soon, thinking of some of my own challenges with clients in the past month. But again, the series is like a power cleanser. In essence, when you take the sum, the meaning of these passages, Christ is the supreme relator to what we're going through. Hebrews 4.16. There's another Hebrews reference for you. No one can relate like us, like Christ can. No one can relate to us, I should say, like Christ can. And, and accordingly, he could be trusted in times of suffering since he set the ultimate precedent through the cross. As long as we're working as blameless ambassadors, pureness of heart, pureness of mind, no self-seeking agenda. There's no shame to those in Christ and are rejected accordingly. Yes, mistakes will happen. They're inevitable. These miscues aren't necessarily safeguarded by your love by Christ identity. Just because you're loved by Christ, I'm sorry, doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. Even outside matters of morality, we are a people who've fallen short. But I think a lot of times we get discouraged. We're easily shaken by that. We want to be the best version of ourselves, and that almost becomes an idol in our life. And we don't meet it. Like, we're disappointed, not because we let anyone down. We're disappointed because we let ourselves down. <laughs> or even in our solace and sorrow, we can be self-centered sometimes. This doesn't have to be a source of disappointment, though. If anything, it should be just the opposite. When you make an honest mistake, when you forget something that normally you wouldn't forget, you have a law on your plate, there's just bound to something to fall off. You're juggling more than you can handle. Sometimes you're in situations where you have more going on than you could take. I know 1 Corinthians 13, 10, I believe. It might be 10, 13. You know, it doesn't say God will not give us more than we can handle. He just he won't tempt us. Temptation is a key word in that passage, by the way. He won't tempt us with what we think we can handle or can't handle. So we got to keep that in mind 
with these passages. We should see moments of suffering as an invitation to see the rock of offense as the reason we forsake offense. We can't neglect offense in our own strength, but it's part of, it's one of the beautiful things about relying on God together. There's going to be things that happen day in and day out, week in, week out, that just rattle us to the core. We can't help but disagree. We can't help but be frustrated. We can't help but be confused. It's okay to feel those things, but when we start taking offense, that's next level. That When we take offense, we've made a choice. We've signed a temporary contract that not only is what our emotions valid, but our emotions, we're entitled to be right because of them. We're entitled to be vindicted. We're entitled to be apologized to or for somehow something, the the universe itself even, just to make things right. That's why I think karma a lot of times is born out of offense. And we use it, you know, in jest, but we don't realize the origins of that word. And... You, what's the opposite of karma, really? I mean, it's the turn cheek principle. When you consider how Jesus kept the cross before him, we can sympathize, empathize, and more, and most importantly, pray for those who hurt us, who wound us, who inflict slander, gossip. They belittle us. Granted, this doesn't save us from bad days when we're wrestling to cope, just trying to make it through. If you feel that way, it's okay. The bottom line is when we lack the strength to stand, are we resting in the arms of God, our living stone, the epitome of steadfastness, who happens to be the reason we breathe and live? Again, go back to 1 Peter 2, if it helps. We're not only called as a royal priesthood, but as fellow constants and faithful stewards, declaring light in a darkening world. If we want to make a difference, and I know you do, why not start by extending grace and understanding to those craving refuge? A lot of times this starts by lending an ear. He who has an ear, let him hear and see what happens. Pray as you listen. If you could get that habit down, by the way, boy, that's powerful. Not only are you guaranteeing that listening to be active, but proactive in a vertical direction, God can impart and all of a sudden, you know, you may not be, well, no, you could be prophetic in that moment. You could say something timely and it may seem like it comes out of the blue, but it's God's spirit in you, giving you words to speak through, the, through his mouthpiece. It's not about making someone's day, but about helping people selflessly. Next step. Can I in any way give you something that will help you take a leap of faith or even just a baby step of faith? Or, you know, if not that, reinforce who God made you to be. You may not even believe in God yet, but you could still point people in the right direction by reinforcing their DNA, their ultimate calling. We may not save them in the moment, but we can direct them as our hearts are aligned. That's the point of aligned hearts, (laughs) coming into work each day with that purity of heart and mind. So there's a lot of parts, there's there's a lot of different ways we can proceed in conversation to this point. But dare to be as consistent as you possibly can, not in your own strength, but just, I, th- I think consistency in continually doing anything good, it, it's a natural overflow of being aligned to Christ. Don't effort to do that. Just know that that's who you're called to be. Faithful stewards, just like God the Master Gardener is continuing to implant things in you, see yourself in a similar fashion. As faithful stewards, you are sowing seeds, declaring righteousness declaring light, declaring encouragement, declaring goodness, declaring the best. Even when we say best wishes to someone, let's understand what we mean by that. When we commit to pray, or if we're we're speaking to a client who happens to be of light faith, let's not just say praying for you in passing, or rather passively. Let's really commit ourselves It's the little things that happen day in and day out that make the biggest difference. And it goes back to the fact that we are called people, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, that we all have a priestly identity at work. It's one of the reasons why His Girl Friday exists. Discovering that priestly identity through our individual vocational callings 
and also that you know in conjunction with the unique spiritual gift mix that we have that profile blending that individual uniqueness with our corporate calling so both of these points d- kind of deal with some of the same things it's the theme of our individual uniqueness and corporate calling and how the two fuse together and i think as that fuses together so will we be able to encourage people better from a pure heart we'll be we'll position ourselves to not grow weary as easily and lose heart we'll help other people do the same we'll be able to discover as an overflow authority confidence how we could better respect one another in all things and all our practices and endeavors uh, but a lot of it goes back to just at the very least learning how to stand and endure with integrity and no doubt you the listener have made this far especially um by listening to this podcast, you've taken that step today. So I'm going to wrap this up. If you have any questions, if you have any prayer requests, you're always welcome to call me, text me, leave a comment to this pod. You could send me a DM on Facebook, even on Instagram, like whatever social media platform you use. You know, we're, we're all over the place from, uh, we're on Spotify, we're on YouTube. I think we're Apple pods too. Um, of course, our website's a great place because there's a comment box below that you can reference us. And then even, um, I don't really reference this a whole lot, but there's a prayer request section on our website, which is uh, will alert us to a personal request, and we'll be happy to intercede with you any way we can. So, as I always say, I will catch you on the fry and go forth and make disciples of all nations, of all offices, of all occupations, of all walks of life. You got this, Christ in you. Catch you on the fry.